Hello. Hello, in this school grad video, we are going to talk all about figures of speech. Figures of speech are important literary devices that are used in English uh, text and paragraphs and also in reading comprehension. So if you are giving the GRE, GMAT or the TOEFL exam, it's very important that you be familiar with the various figures of speech. A lot of people get confused between parts of speech and figures of speech. Parts of speech are more like nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives and other constructs that are used in grammar. Figures of speech are more literally devices that are used to you know, bring flavor, enhancements and beauty to the English language. So let's study the various figures of speech with examples. First of all, a simile. So what's a simile? A simile is a comparison of two unlikely ideas or objects using the words like like and as. So it's about comparing two different objects or themes or ideas. For example, as cool as a cucumber. So as white as milk. As slow as a snail. As cunning as a fox. So when you see this kind of comparison, you know, as cunning as something, as slow as something, where there is a comparison, it's always a simile. Some more examples of similes. I wandered lonely as a cloud. So that's in one of uh, the famous poems about the daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud, you know, over the hills, and then I saw a host of golden daffodils. So I wandered lonely as a cloud. So notice that here the as is missing. I wandered as lonely as a cloud. But even though the as is missing, it's implied. So it's still a simile. As sweet as sugar candy. And then as nimble as a deer. As brave as a lion. So if you see a sentence like, you know, our soldiers fought as brave as lions. That is a simile. And where there is no direct comparison, it becomes a metaphor. So suppose they said, the soldiers were brave lions. So there was no comparison, like, you know, as brave as lions. Suppose they said, brave lions, then that would be a metaphor. So, cute like a kitten. So, instead of using as cute as a kitten, it says cute like a kitten. That's also a simile. Uh, her tongue is sharp and dangerous, like a sword. So that's also a simile. Let's talk about metaphors. So this is another type of figures of speech. So a metaphor is an implied comparison without the use of comparative words like as or like. There's a direct comparison. That's a metaphor. For example, the camel is the ship of the desert. So it's a, it gives people brevity, you know, so it makes the statements more concise. Instead of saying, just like the ship is the only means of transport in the ocean, the camel is often the only means of transport in the desert. That's what they're trying to say. So instead of saying it in such a loquacious way, they say it very concisely. The camel is the ship of the desert. So this kind of direct comparison is called a metaphor. He is the black sheep of his family. So a black sheep is someone who, is, uh, who hasn't achieved much in life, who is more like a disgrace, who is an embarrassment to his family. So suppose his family consisted of all high achievers. Then we say he is the black sheep of his family. Just like in a flock of sheep, if there's all white sheep and there's one black sheep that's not very uh, appealing somehow, that's like the embarrassment to the herd. So just like... A black sheep is an embarrassment to the rest of the white sheep in some way. The, he is an embarrassment to his family. So they say he is the black sheep of his family. So this kind of direct reference is called a metaphor. Necessity is the mother of invention. So it means uh, when you really need something, desperately need to achieve something, you find a way of doing something, then we invent ways to do it. Like we desperately needed light at night and we invented the electric bulb. So it, what it means is that the necessity is what causes inventions. So this kind of direct reference is metaphor. The exam was a breeze. Just like a breeze signifies something easy and calm and relaxing without having to do any work, the exam was easy. That's what it's trying to say. It was a breeze. A couch potato. If you come across such terms, 
you must know that there's a direct allusion to something and that's a metaphor. A roller coaster of emotions. Just like a roller coaster sends you through, you know, an ups and downs and a ride full of, you know, uh, a tipsy turvy kind of thing. It was a roller coaster of emotions, sends you through all kinds of emotions. High and dry. It's also a metaphor. And bottled up emotions. Just like something bottled up is trying to escape. You know, the emotions are trying to escape. You've suppressed your emotions for a long time. These are bottled up emotions. Ocean of knowledge. A sea of umbrellas. It just denotes something vast. Instead of saying, just as the ocean is so vast, there was knowledge so vast. That's what it's trying to say. But it's saying it in a direct way, so it's a metaphor. A blanket of love, or a blanket of snow, or a blanket of hope. Silken lies. So they were so smooth, the lies were so cunning, they were like silken lies. You know, as, you know, tricky as, like silk. Sweet dreams. That's also a metaphor. Because dreams, you know, have no taste, but... Just like something sweet makes you feel happy, the dreams made you happy, so they were sweet dreams. A rainbow of hope, rainbow of flavors, it means a variety, a strong sensation of hope or flavors. The evening of one's life, just as the evening is the end of the day, it was, he was in the last stage of his life, meaning he was an old man or something, so he was in the evening of his life. Wheels of justice. So it talks about like how the wheels drive, you know, make a car move. The wheels of justice make the justice process move. Shades of excellence, shades of hope. Melting pot. So a melting pot is like a place where various cultures and people meet together and live together. So that's what it means. Just like in a pot you add various different ingredients and they all melt and it forms one kind of gruel or one kind of a porridge or something. Like say the United States is a melting pot of cultures. There are people from so many different countries who live here. It's called the melting pot of cultures. Moral compass. Early bird. So early bird is anyone who gets to a place early uh, in, or who launches a company early you know, before his competitors. Anyone who does something earlier than the others is an early bird. Just like the early bird gets the worm. The early bird in the market would get you know, the biggest share of the profit. Domino effect. So that talks about, like if you have a bunch of dominoes, they all go cascading down. One hits the other, and the other hits the other, and there's a whole avalanche of dominoes. So anytime there's, you know, some kind of a ripple effect, it's called a domino effect. Apple of my eye. So this is also, it means someone who's very dear to you. Like I was the apple of my father's eye. He loved me so much. So that's what it means, apple of my eye. A euphemism. A euphemism is a use of an inexpensive, inoffensive expression to soften a sharper one. So it may be in the form of abbreviations, like you say B.O. instead of body odor. It makes it somehow less offens offensive. Instead of saying toilet, you say W.C. I think it refers to Western come out. So that's, it's just somehow makes it less obnoxious or less offensive. It can, this is also a euphemism. And... Foreign words may be used to replace an impolite expression, like faux. So, you know, in French we say faux pas. Like, you know, foolish error. So if you're sending in someone an email and you say, there's foolish error, they might get really offended. But instead you say the faux pas. And then it's not so offensive somehow. So it just makes it less offensive. Sometimes they're abstractions. Like, you know, before I go means before I die. Before I die sounds kind of harsh. And so before I go is a softer way of saying it. There may also be indirect expressions replacing direct ones, which may sound offensive. Like, for example, rare and unmentionables. So instead of saying things like that, you just soften it somehow. Using longer words or phrases can also mask unpleasantness, unpleasant words. Say flatulence instead of farting. So it somehow makes it less obnoxious. Perspiration instead of sweat. Mentally challenged for stupid. <laughs> Using technical terms may reduce the rudeness exhibited by words. So gluteus maximus, that's 
a term used instead of, you know, a more offensive expression. Deliberately mispronouncing an offensive word may reduce its severity. Like you say, darn, instead of like, damn. So a lot of parents don't want to say damn in front of the kids. They say, darn, it somehow makes it a little less offensive. That's also a euphemism. Shoot, you know, you actually meant to say shit, but then you don't want to say shit in front of your kids. So you say, oh shoot, you know, that kind. It just makes it less offensive. So some more examples of euphemisms. He reached his heavenly abode is a euphemism for he died. Suppose you're breaking the news to his family members. You don't want to say, hey, your father's dead. You want to say, you know, he reached his heavenly abode or you say he left us or, you know, it's, it's a just polite way of saying it. So before I go is instead of before I die. We do not hire mentally challenged people. Means we don't hire stupid people. He's a special child. Instead of saying a disabled, retarded child, we say he's a special child. He needs special care and attention. She's going the family way. It's just a polite way of saying she's pregnant or she's carrying. You say he's going the family way. Irony. So irony is another kind of figure of speech. A statement in which the real meaning is exactly the opposite of what is literally conveyed. So it's kind of sarcasm, you know. Uh, it can also be a kind of uh, tricky situation. So, uh, for example, in Julius Caesar, we all know how uh, Mark Anthony was saying, for Brutus is an honorable man. What he was actually trying to say is, he was pointing out all the bad things that Brutus did, and he was trying to make the crowd agitated and turn against Brutus. But not directly by saying, Brutus is a traitor, but he said, this is what Brutus did, and Brutus is an honorable man. And the crowd began to think, was he really honorable? No. But he actually wanted to say the opposite, but then he wanted to, you know, turn the crowd against Brutus, but he, he used irony. So this is an example of irony. He literally conveyed the opposite of what he was trying to say. When someone steps on your toes and asks you if that hurt, you say, Oh no, not at all. I enjoyed it. Do it all over again. So if you're on the bus and there's this fat lady with uh, pointed heels, steps on your toes, he says, Oh my God, I'm sorry, did that hurt? He's like, No, not at all. Why don't you do it again? You don't really mean it, but you're conveying your anger by saying exactly the opposite of what you intend to say. That's an example of irony. And irony may also be situational. You laugh at a person who slipped, stepping on a banana peel. And the next thing you know, you slip too. So that's a situational irony. Some more examples of irony. So, I found a video on Facebook about how using Facebook is such a waste of time. So if it is such a waste of time, then why are you making a video about it and putting it on Facebook? It's kind of a situational irony. The fat opera singer's name was Tiny. So her name was ironical to her physical stature. So the butter is as soft as a marble piece. So we all know marble is really hard. It doesn't cut easily, right? So you're trying to say the butter is so hard, but you're saying it ironically, you know, using irony. We say the butter is as soft as a marble piece. So, well. Oh, great. Now you've broken my new laptop. So there's nothing great about it, but we use irony to convey our anger often. So he's just saying, oh shoot, you broke my laptop. He's saying, oh great, you broke my laptop. You know, it, it means exactly the same thing. And there are also terms like, for example, you know, a wise guy. A wise guy is not a wise person. A wise guy is literally a fool. So instead of saying a fool, we say, oh, he's a wise guy. So it's just an ironical way of referring to him. Personification. Personification is the referring to an object or an idea as a human or living person. So we refer to an object or an abstract concept as a living person. That is personification. Death lays his icy hands on kings. So death, as you know, is not a person. There may be a god of death, but Death is an abstract concept and we say death is personified as a person, lays his icy hands on kings. So even kings have to die someday is what we are trying to say. This is personification of death. Tom built this new house. Isn't she a beauty? So the house, isn't she a beauty? 
they refer to the house as a woman, or as a female person. So we also talk about motherland and fatherland, you know. My country, she is so beautiful. My country is so rich. She is the richest country of all. We talk about motherland as she. It's not a living female person. It's a country. It's a geographical country. But we talk about, you know, we personify the country using, you know, he or she. So we all know about Krishna, the story when Krishna was born. As Vasudeva carried baby Krishna in a basket across the Yamuna River, so she swelled up and rose just to touch his feet and get his blessings. So we all know the story how Vasudeva was carrying Krishna in a basket and the river started the river Yamuna started swelling up and the moment she touched the baby Krishna's feet, she receded. So we refer to Yamuna River as she, she's a goddess. So this is again personification of the river. Some more examples. My new car is a beauty, isn't she? We can also personify a car. You know, refer to her as like a person, living person. The wind whispered through the silent forest. So the wind is like a living person whispering through the forest. The flower danced, the flowers danced in the gentle breeze. So the flowers are like living entities who danced in the, the, in the gentle breeze. All they were doing was like swaying to the breeze, but it looks like they, they personified as living objects who are dancing in the breeze. So, time and tide waits for none. Time and tide is considered like one object. It's like one idea. Time waits for none, tide waits for none. They just happen when they have to happen. They don't take your permission. So, time and tide waits for none. It's like a personified entity. They, it waits for none. It's like he or she. Time and tide, he waits for none. You know, it's like a personification of time and tide. The fire swallowed the entire forest. As you know, only a living person can really swallow something like food. But the fire burned the entire forest down. But we say swallowed the entire forest. So it's like personification. The ocean swallowed the ship. What it means is that the ship sank to the bottom of the ocean. But we say the ocean was so uh, fierce or you know, roaring so that it swallowed the ship. So it's like personification of the ocean. The waves washed her feet, kissing them with reverence. So the waves are personified as living entities. They washed her feet and kissed them with reverence. All they did was, you know, the waves just, you know, made her feet wet. But the way you describe it makes it like beautiful. They washed her feet, kissing them with reverence. So, it just makes it so beautiful. This is about personification. Apostrophe. A direct address to an absent or dead person or personified thing. So, when there is an object or like a dead person who is not in front of you and who is a personified item, like you know, it's an abstract thing and you address it directly. That is apostrophe. Example. O oh, pain and sorrow, why do you trouble me thus? So he's directly addressing pain and sorrow. O oh, pain and sorrow, why do you trouble me? Why don't you leave me alone? You know, pain and sorrow is not a living thing. It's personified. But then you're addressing an abstract entity directly. That is an apostrophe. Jane Taylor uses apostrophe in the well-known nursery rhyme, so the star. So we all heard about, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky. So it's like a poem addressed directly to the star. We're communicating with this item, the objects. So, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So it's like you're you know, talking, talking directly to the star. This is an apostrophe. Some more examples of apostrophes. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon in Romeo and Juliet. So we are directly addressing the sun, you know, for dramatic effect. Arise and kill the envious moon. So the moon is also kind of personified here. So, But then we are addressing the sun directly, an object directly, that is an apostrophe. Oh, medicine, please work fast and save my life. So we are addressing the medicine directly. So this is an apostrophe. It's just a literary construct. 
Dear moon, your, bo your beams bring solace to my lonely heart. So we're addressing the moon, so that's also an example of uh, an apostrophe. Oxymoron. Putting together the most unlikely or contradictory terms is an oxymoron. So, oxymorons may be one word, two words, or more. A lot of people think oxymorons are usually only two words. Like, um, uh, you know, um, happily married. Many people think it's an oxymoron because, you know, a lot of people don't have happiness in marriage. So, a lot of people are unhappy in marriage. So, happily married, they think, is an oxymoron. Like, you know, it's not necessarily an oxymoron, but some people like to believe it is. So, they usually think it's two words that contract each other, but it can also be one word which has two contradicting parts. That's also an oxymoron. It can be more than two words long, too. For example, anyone. Any means one of many, right? Any means it can be many, but then one. So within this word, there are two contradictory terms. Anyone is an oxymoron. Everyone. So every means all and one means singular. So within this word, there is an oxymoron. Sleepwalk. So as you know, when you're sleeping, you can't walk, and when you're walking, you can't sleep. But sleepwalk, the word itself is an oxymoron. Same with hometown, supernatural, bittersweet, audiovisual, homework, typewriter, sunshade, extraordinary, deadbeat, fruitcake, spendthrift, seashore, roadblock. So these are all examples of oxymorons. Some more examples of oxymorons. These are two-word oxymorons. Open secret. So if it's a secret, it's closed, but it's open, everybody knows it's no longer a secret. Open secret. Tragic comedy. Seriously funny. Awfully pretty. Foolish wisdom. Original copies. Almost exactly. All alone. Act natural. You know, either you're natural or you're acting. You can't act natural, so that's an oxymoron. A self-contradictory term. A combination of two contradictory terms. Fairly dark, very little. So very simplifies something large and little. It's actually very little means very small amount. <laughs> but it has contradictory terms in it. So ill health. If you're Ill, Ill, you're not healthy. And if you're healthy, you're not ill. But ill health means bad health. Larger half. So if it's half, it's neither large nor small. But it's, it's larger half. So civil war. <laughs> Cruel joke. Good grief, fuzzy logic, deafening silence. It, a deafening silence actually means like it's so silent that it's like pin drop silence. But it says it's a deafening silence. Mighty weak. It actually means very, very weak. Young adult, home office, barely dressed. The careful carelessness of her attire. <laughs> She took a lot of care to appear careless. So that's what it means. So these are examples of oxymorons. Onomatopoeia. So onomatopoeia is the use of words whose sound suggests their meaning. So these are words which sound like something. And it also means something. So like say the buzz of bees. We could have called it anything else like the ABC of bees. But we call it the buzz of bees because when the bee goes buzz, it sounds like buzz. So a word that sounds like what it's trying to convey is a buzz. Like this is onomatopoeia, an example of onomatopoeia. The hissing of snakes. Snakes go hiss. So when you say hissing of snakes, it's like hissing is also the sound made by snakes. So this is onomatopoeia. The stone fell into the river with a splash. So when it falls, the actual sound it makes is like a splash. Splash. So a splash is an example of onomatopoeia. The books fell off the table with a loud thump. So the exact sound made by the books when they fall is like thump. So the word thump is onomatopoeia. The eagle flew across the roaring sky. The sky must have been roaring. So that's an example of onomatopoeia. The forest was silent, but for the rustling of leaves. So when leaves rustle, the sound made is rustle, rustle. So that's an example of 
onomatopoeia. Sounds of water. It's a plop, splash, gush, sprinkle, drizzle, drip. These are examples of onomatopoeia related to water. So, human voice sounds. Growl, giggle. You know, when you giggle, that's this kind of sound you make. Grunt, murmur, blurt, chatter. These are examples of onomatopoeia. Different sounds of wind, swish, swoosh, whiff, whoosh, whiz, whisper. These are examples of onomatopoeia. Animal sounds like meow, moo, neigh. So when a horse neighs, it actually says neigh, you know. It's exactly the kind of sound it makes. And when the cat meows, it says meow. So the word meow is exactly the sound made by the cat. So that's an example of onomatopoeia. Tweet, oink, ba, made by sheep. So these are examples of onomatopoeia. Alliteration. An alliteration is the repetition of the same sound at the beginning of each word. For example, Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled pepper. The sentences was constructed in such a way that the beginning of the words all start with the same kind of sound. Betty Butter bought some butter, but the butter was bitter. So this is another example of an alliteration. It's also a kind of a tongue twister, but it's more of an alliteration. Anacolithon. So it's a sentence where the construction is changed midway. For example, my feeling is, why don't you take a holiday? It probably means like, you know, you're so stressed out, why don't you go take a holiday somewhere? You're trying to say, my feeling is that you're so stressed out, but you say it in a different way. My feeling is, why don't you go take a holiday? So, you know, it's another way of saying what you're trying to say. This is an example of an anacolithon. Hyperbole. An exaggeration or overstatement for emphasis. For example, all the horses in Arabia cannot drag me away from this project. So, you know, the horses in Arabia have nothing to do with your software project. So, you're working on a project and you say, I want to do this project, I want to be in it and nothing can take me away from this. Maybe your family members are pressuring you to go on a vacation or somebody is pressuring you to go watch a movie and you say, all the horses in Arabia cannot persuade me to leave this project. All the horses in Arabia cannot drag me away from this project. It means you are so into this project that nobody can take you away from it. But the way you say it, you use a literary construct about the horses in Arabia just to make it, you know, sound fancy. But it's an example of a hyperbole. It's an exaggeration or overstatement for emphasis. So it's like, suppose your uh, mom is calling you for dinner and you're playing a video game and you say, you know, even if you hang upside down and even if you you know, bring the whole neighborhood down, even if you call the cops, I'm not coming to dinner in the next half an hour. So it's like an exaggeration, and that's a hyperbole. All the money in the world cannot bring back my dead father. So I'm ready to pay billions of dollars, but it can't bring back my dead father. It's an exaggeration that tries to emphasize your loss. It tries to, you know, uh, narrate how you're feeling. Hyperbole. So, some more examples. My grandmother is as old as the hills. You know, the hills are like millions of years old, but we say my grandmother is as old as the hills. Your backpack weighs a ton. We know it can't weigh more than 10 kilos, but we say it weighs a ton, just to emphasize, exaggerate how heavy it is. She's as heavy as an elephant. She's probably not as heavy as an elephant, but we just want to exaggerate it. That's a hyperbole. I'm dying of this cold. You know, people don't die of little colds usually, but, you know, when you're exaggerating, that's a hyperbole. I have a million things to take care of for the wedding. You might have maybe 10,000 things or 1,000 things, but not a million things, but you exaggerate just to tell them how busy you are. That's a hyperbole. So, anadiplosis. This is the next figure of speech. Anadiplosis is the repetition of a word or a group of words at the end of a phrase and the beginning of another for rhetorical effect. The explanation is so clear, so clear that no one can misunderstand my intentions. So you say it, you don't have to say it twice, but you say it twice because 
you're trying to emphasize it for rhetorical effect. This is an example of analytic process. How is it different from hyperbole where you exaggerate? Hyperbole is all about using examples like as old as the hills, a million things to take care of. That's a hyperbole. But another process is when you repeat the same words again and again, you know, for emphasis. This is another process. Antithesis. So contrasting ideas put together. For example, we fight a war to bring peace. You know, war is marked by so much bloodshed and hatred and enmity and loss. And they think it brings peace, but I don't know if it does. It's like a, two contradictory ideas in one sentence. Man proposes, God disposes. So man is trying to do all these things, but ultimately it's God who decides what's going to happen. So it's two contradictory ideas in one sentence. Love is an ideal thing, marriage is a real thing. So we're talking about two contradictory ideas in one sentence. And these are some more examples. Speech is silver, but silence is gold. So if you don't know how to say the right things, you might as well shut up. That's what it means. Patience is bitter, but it has a sweet fruit. Means you're patient for a long time, but the fruits it bears are good. It pays off. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Means listen to everyone, but be caref very careful about who you reveal information to, because they may mis misinterpret and misuse your information. So, money is the root of all evils, poverty is the fruit of all goodness. It's two contradictory ideas in one statement. You're easy on the eyes, but hard on the heart. Means, you're beautiful to look at, but you're so stone-hearted. You know, you're not easy to please. You're evil. So, this is two ideas in one sentence. These are examples of antithesis. So, for example, in Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities, there is this unforgettable antithesis example. It opens with these, you know, statements. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had, we had nothing before us. And we were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct to the other way. So there's all these contradictory statements. This was like the opening of his famous novel, the Tale of, A Tale of Two Cities. Charles Dickens, one of my favorite authors, he used antithesis to open his novel for, you know, emphasis and, you know, to explain how contradictory the times were. Means there was good thing and bad things happening at the same time. So by using contrasting structures in these parallel structures, contrasting ideas, he highlights the conflict that existed at the time. So, a tautology, this is the next figure of speech. A tautology is the needless repetition of words for emphasis. So, uh, so how is it uh, different from, like, you know, some other kind of uh, figures of speech where we use, you know, the repetition of the same kind of words. Here we use different kinds of words. So, look ahead in front of you. So, we don't say... Look in front, in front of you. That would be a different figure of speech. So look ahead, in front of you. When you say look ahead, it's always in front of you. So this in front of you part is waste. Obviously look in front of you. So we say it in two different ways. So this is a needless repetition of words for emphasis. This is a tautology. When we use different words, it's a tautology. Repeat that again. When you say repeat it, it means you say it again. So it's like a waste of words when you say it twice. Shout that out loudly, please. When you shout, you always talk loudly. So you don't have to say shout it loudly. It's implied. The glass is totally empty. When it's empty, it means it's totally empty. But we say totally em empty for emphasis. That's a tautology. Your mother is completely devoid of any jealousy. You say completely devoid. When you say devoid, it means completely you're not having something. So completely is kind of a waste, a, an exaggeration. We say it just for emphasis and rhetorical effect. So completely devoid, that's a tautology. Malapropism. Malapropism is a word misused because of confusion with the similar sounding words, often creating a comic effect. It's a misused word because of confusion with a similar sounding word. So she became historical after the incident. What she means, she became hysterical means 
She was laughing hysterically after the incident. That's what it means. But instead of saying hysterical, they say historical. Historical is something that happened like centuries ago, something in history. So she didn't become historical, she became hysterical. But when you say it using the wrong sounding word because of confusion, it makes it funny. This is an example of a malapropism. She was littering in the park when... Jack was littering in the park when he saw Mary. You know, to litter is like to defecate, to poop in the park. But what he was doing just was loitering. He was not littering, he was loitering. So when I was a child, I would get confused between littering and loitering. So he was loitering, walking around in the park when he saw Mary. But he was littering in the park. Littering can also mean like, you know, throwing garbage and, you know, dirtying the park in some way. So he wasn't dirtying the park, he was just loitering around. But it makes it kind of funny and comical, right? This is a malapropism. Aposiopesis or ellipsis. So, aposiopesis or ellipsis, sudden breaking off in a sentence for dramatic effect. So, there was complete darkness. The door opened and... You leave it like that, so it just makes you guess. You know, that's an example of an ellipse. You just leave it like that for special effects. Assonance. Assonance is the repetition of the same vowel sound producing a rhyming effect. So, you know this... Uh, famous statement in um, one of the popular movies where, you know, was it Audrey Hepburn? She says, the rain in Spain stays mainly on the plain. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, these are terms that rhyme, sound like each other. So, the repetition of the same vowel sound for a rhyming effect is assonance. Good to get pay at the end of the day. So pay and day are rhyming, so that's an assonance. First the family head gets to eat the bread. Every night, in spite of his poor sight, he sends the moonlight. So that's an example of an assonance. He went here and there and everywhere. That's also an assonance. Some more effects, like rhyming effects in poems. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all of a sudden, all at once, I saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So there's this uh, rhyming effect, cloud and crowd, hills and daffodils. So a host of golden daffodils. So there's this O sound that repeats. So this is an example of an assonance. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, beneath the trees. It's kind of a repetitive sound. That's an assonance. So trees and breeze. So again, that's a sign assonance. So these are examples of assonance. Ascendaton is an omission of conjunctions. Conjunctions are used to join two sentences. For example, I came and I saw and I conquered. But we say, I came, I saw, I conquered for emphasis and special effects. This is an example of an ascendaton. Conveying an affirmative by negating the opposite. So... You meant to say, you are smart, and you say, you're no fool. Means you're smart, come on, why don't you see this? The attacker was no novice in pursuing criminals. What we are saying is, the attacker was an expert in pursuing criminals. He knew all about their strategies, so he was no novice. Means he was not an amateur. It's just a way of saying he was an expert. Pathetic fallacy. So, attributing human feelings to natural or inanimate objects. So, the clouds seemed to weep tears of sorrow at his funeral. The, all the clouds were doing was, you know, raining, okay? It was just raining. But you say, the clouds were seeming, it seemed like they were weeping tears of sorrow at his funeral. You attribute human feelings to natural or inanimate objects, and that is an example of a pathetic fallacy. The truck groaned under the weight. That's an, again, example of a pathetic fallacy. So, the next figure of speech is a syllapsis. A syllapsis is the use of a single word to apply to two others in a different way. So, he read the book and my thoughts. He read the book in a different way and he read her thoughts in a different way. It means he sensed what she was thinking. He read the book and my thoughts. So, he, the use of read in two different ways applied to two different objects. 
When they lost the battle, they lost not only their honor, but also their beautiful queen. So they lost the battle, they lost their honor. So they were ashamed. And they lost their beautiful queen. She was probably taken captive. So they lost it in two different ways. So that's an example of a celepsis. As the actress aged, she lost her looks and her fame. She lost her looks, her physical beauty, and her fame. She lost it in another way because nobody was offering her movies anymore. She lost her looks in a different way and her fame in another way. So she lost two things. Lost in two different ways. That's an example of a celepsis. Sindosh. So a sindosh is the use of a part to represent the whole or vice versa. For example, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown means a king has so many responsibilities he can't go to sleep peacefully. That's what it means. We are referring to the head alone but it's the whole body that is you know, not able to get good sleep, right? So the use of the head refers to the whole body of the king. So uneasy lies the, the person that wears a crown. That's what we are trying to say. But we say the head just for kind of dramatic effect. The word bread refers to food or money as in journalism is my bread and butter means I do journalism for money but it's my bread and butter. So or we say like sole breadwinner. Use of bread to refer to the whole of food is an example of a synodosh, synecdosh. The phrase grey beard refers to an old man. So we only talk about his beard that's grey. Come on, the rest of his hair is also grey. And he's also old and has wrinkled skin. But we only talk about his grey beard. It refers to the whole old man. So the speaker felt nervous looking at the ocean of faces in the audience. He looked at the ocean of people, the last amount, large amount of people, and that's what made him nervous. Not just the faces. But we refer to the faces to refer to the whole person. So this is an example of a synecdoche. The word sails refers to a whole ship. So the word suits refers to businessmen. So all these suits came in. Come on, the suits didn't come in by themselves. The men wearing the suits came in. The word boots usually refers to soldiers. The term Coke is a synecdoche for all carbonated drinks. So whether it's Pepsi or Limca or any kind of carbonated drink, we usually say, I'm getting a Coke. That's like a synecdoche. Pentagon is a synecdoche and refers to a few decision makers. And the word glasses refers to spectacles. Coppers refers to coins. Come on, copper can mean anything, okay? You can use copper for so many things. But we say the coppers to refer to coins. And that's an example of a synecdoche. Metonymy is the use of a term to refer to a wider idea. The bench used to refer to judges. So, you know, uh, judges are associated with the bench. But when you refer to the bench, in order to, when you're actually trying to refer to judges, that's an example of a metonymy. You're using this concept to refer to a bunch of people. That's a metonymy. So, uh, the crown refers to the king and the, or the queen, or both. So how is a synecdoche different from a metonymy? Synecdoche examples are often misidentified as metonymy. Okay, so both may resemble each other to some extent, but they're not the same. Synecdoche refers to the whole of a thing by the name of any one of its parts. Calling a car wheels is a synecdoche because a part of a car wheel stands for the whole car. So, in a synecdoche, we describe another thing as closely linked to that particular thing, but it's not necessarily a part of it. The crown refers to power or authority. Metonymy used to replace the word king or queen. So, you know, a wheel is a part of a car, so that's a synecdoche. Crown is not necessarily a part of a king or queen's body, but so that would be a metonymy. So I hope you get the difference. Go over this again, and then you'll probably get the difference. So it's kind of tricky. So This brings us to the end of this video about figures of speech.